I was an art teacher for a long time and I saw how people people of all ages would just be, say things like, I'm not good at art. I'm not creative. And I, I was just I was just like, that is, that's ridiculous. Like we're born creative. La 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 the things you want to do. La 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 the things you want to do. Hi everyone. I'm Liz Sumner and this is I Always Wanted To, the podcast where I interview people who are doing things that others long to do. What have you always wanted to try? Someday I will heed the call and sail off into the blue. Someday I will bag it all and do the things I want to do. La 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 la, the things you want to do. La 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 la, the things you want to do. Hi everyone. Listening to Catherine Monahan talk about ceramics got me thinking about my own creative pursuits. Their world is tangible. The clay is gritty or buttery. Catherine talks about the physical elements in it and the way you work it to make all the particles align. Listening to them describe the qualities of the material made me realize that I create in a much more abstract way. Sound waves are, of course, physical, but I, I don't think of them that way. I do use my hands, but most often on a keyboard or a mouse. I produce artifacts, but they're mostly digital. People who create with touchable materials must have a different experience when they make their art, and I'm curious about it. Catherine was a great bridge between the physical and the abstract, because as a podcaster and storyteller, as well as a ceramicist, they know how to speak of the solid and intangible in ways that I can understand and find fascinating. I hope you agree. Here's the interview. My guest today, Catherine Monahan, is an audio storyteller and artist and host of the podcast Material Feels. When I listened to their episode from October on ceramics, the description of the properties of clay and the whole firing process, I was captivated and I wanted to learn more. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks so much for having me, Liz. So tell me how you discovered ceramics. Uh, well, ceramics kind of discovered me in the sense that I was not expecting it. I didn't even know what the word ceramics meant. Uh, I was 13 and I had signed up for a painting class. I was a freshman in high school and I was expecting, really looking forward to being in a painting class. And I had this grand plan of being an art major and being a painter uh, and the class was full. So I got put in a ceramics course and I didn't even know what that, I was like, what is ceramics? That sounds weird. And what is, what am I going to be working with? And I was in the class with somebody who ended up being my, one of my best friends in high school. And the teacher was fabulous. He was had so much personality and I loved it. And I just, I, I just fell into ceramics for the rest of high school. That was like my thing. I, I've listened to the, the last couple of your podcasts and you go into really fascinating detail about the fundamentals of, of clay. And I, I, I want to definitely send people to material fields so they can get the whole thing, but give, can you give us a taste of the kind of detail you talked about? Sure. Sure. So I, I explore the material, like the rela our relationship to the material in, in the sense of pressing into it and moving it and rolling it out. But I also go a little deeper and talk about like the microscopic makeup of the material and how the the different particles in it line up and why wedging it is good, which is when you kind of need it and how it transforms with heat through the firing process and, and what glazing can do. And I actually learned about this over the course of the 20 years that I've worked with clay. And it wasn't the kind of thing that I was even interested in when I was a teenager or even in my twenties. But as I started to you know, you find ceramic studios and you are a member or you maybe you're a kiln tech or you volunteer and do work trade. And so as I've 
as I've explored the world, I've had lots of different kinds of mentors and I've learned more and more. And there's just, it's like peeling back layers. Like there's always more to learn about it. And I think when you spend so much time with the material, you begin to get acquainted with it as if it's a a best friend or a lover or a family member. And so, yeah. And so you, the particulars begin to be important and fascinating. And so I do in my, in my show, I do explore like down to the molecular makeup of the material to how you can push it and how it can be wacky and weird. And and that's stuff that just like through quality time, it it begins to be, I think, fascinating. I can imagine that somebody can learn how to, to make ceramics without knowing that kind of detail. But what else? I mean, you you said that it helps you get to know the material. What what other things? Why is it important to know the fundamentals before you start working with a with or or as you are working with the material? When someone begins working with clay, it's not not important. They sh- they shouldn't worry about it because a mm-hmm. lot of people have creative blocks and it will make them feel like they don't know enough, that they have to study it. But after you get some experience with it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like just like the next stage in the relationship where you, you start to wonder why, why is porcelain different from, from earthenware? Uh, Why is, where does this clay come from? How do people harvest clay? Like there's a kind of a whole world to it. And and if you can, once you make a like a sort of a heart connection with the material, then I feel like you can get into the heady space. And it's just a cycle that keeps building until you have like a really meaningful part of your life is 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 connected to the material world. I've not worked with clay before. I've seen people do it and it's magical how some how a little lump turns into something else just by being on a spinning wheel. But I never thought about it the way that you describe it. It really makes it much more interesting to me. So, okay. So is there a particular pattern in your experience? Have you seen people come to working with ceramics in in a certain way or people come from lots of different uh, avenues in order and discover it in different ways? What What's your experience? That's a great question. I think that a lot of adults will take a class they'll do a one-off class they'll maybe do a class with as a date or they'll go in with a friend or yeah the adult classes are usually at night and they might try it out for a one-time thing or a couple weeks a lot of I was a ceramics instructor at a children's studio and so a lot of kids would come through and it would kind of be their like after school decompression fun time and some people like at the at the ceramic studio Merit Ceramics in Oakland where I am a member uh when I'm like chatting with other members some people started they're making amazing things that that they started 2 years ago 3 years ago so it's not the kind of thing where like like I've just always had clay in my life since I was 13 but I don't I don't think you really need to to do it for 20 years to like to be good at it. I mean, maybe that might be a controversial thing to say, but I really think that you can dive in. And then uh, if you love it and you do it a lot within a couple of years, like you'll be making stuff that you're, that you're proud of. I love that. When I talk to other people in the studio and the, that I'm a part of, a lot of people picked up ceramics during the pandemic and, you know, this yeah, so they were able to come into the studio, and it was everyone was wearing masks, and it's well ventilated, and not a lot of people. Um, so the pandemic actually opened up some some awareness where people were looking for connection, looking for something to do, and looking for a way to create that felt safe. So that's that's one way that um, people have found ceramics recently. What are the different ways of working with clay that you um, recommend, certainly for beginners? Sure. I mean, hopping on the wheel is always a good idea. Um, I do think it helps to have a mentor or be in a class for that. Um, Hand building is uh, pretty accessible uh, and and you can um, 
use a lot of tools at home with hand building and making, you know, forms, uh, functional forms or sculptures. You can roll out clay and make imprints and stamp things on it or carve it. You can use it for sculpture. And then, you know, you mentioned that I had talked about polymer clay recently uh, on my show and polymer clay is very accessible because the difference is, is that the main difference is that you can bake it uh, at home. You can cure it. It can be a finished piece, just popping it in the oven uh, for, you know, 30 minutes or more, depending on how big your piece is. Amazing. So is there a, a particular type of clay that's easier to start with? If you were going to do something like to, to make bowls or vases or something on a wheel, what's a, a good way to start? That's a good question. There will be like descriptions of clay where you can see um, how much grit it has. Like, and grit is basically like little particles of, of sand that make it more structurally sound uh, and firm to throw with. But the, the, the challenges is that some people, when they get on the wheel, their hands behave differently. So one person might love throwing with soft, buttery clay and their hands just, it just works. They're, maybe they have a more gentle touch. Uh, maybe they touch the clay less because when you touch, the, the more you touch the clay, the flimsier it can get. So people spend a lot of time trying to make something perfect and then it will ruin it. So uh -huh. The soft buttery clay might be better for some people with a certain touch, a certain patience level uh, or confidence level. And then the firmer clay might be better for people who really want to get in there and, and <laughs> you know, like have, a, have some strong fingers. I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> totally, it really is a preference. And that's why it's important to just try it and then reflect mm -hmm. on it and not take it personally if you feel like you failed. Mm-hmm. And, and tell me about glazes. What, what, what are they made of? What do they do? Glazes contain silica, uh, alumina, flux, colorants, and modifiers. And uh, basically what all that you need to know is that you dip your piece in after you've fired it once, you put it back in the kiln, it heats it up uh, to a very high temperature, and the glaze becomes liquid glass around the ceramic and makes it, uh, the ceramic piece, and makes it uh, food safe and stronger and shiny and beautiful. And they can be, you can dip different glazes in, you can do wax resist, which is when you paint wax on the piece and then glaze it. And the places where you painted wax will not get, will not get glaze on them. So you can cr create patterns. There's lots of ways to experiment. I have a, a belief that that it's it's hard to know exactly what the glaze is going to look like until after it's been fired. Is that is that accurate? Sometimes uh, glaze can be finicky because maybe your your hands maybe you got some other glaze on it while you were while you were glazing. It can react differently to if the kiln is loaded in a certain way and it gets hot. At, at a it, it, like it's fired at a certain way like the actually the way of firing it can change how the glaze looks mm -hmm. uh and then the how many times you dip it you can dip it tw your piece twice three times one time and that will change the color um, but a lot of studios will have test tiles where you can see what something will look like and then you know it's kind of like you have a you have a general sense um however there are uh, potters and ceramicists that like glazing is like a science and they figure it out and they test and they test and they, and their pieces come out the way that they expect them to, because they really put a lot of time and energy into that aspect of it. And why is it that sometimes things explode in the kiln? <laughs> um, things can explode in the kiln because the kiln could have been set to the wrong uh, settings and fire too hot or cooled too fast. And they can also explode in the kiln because there are air bubbles inside of the uh, greenware is what we call it, which is when it, it's like you've just made the piece, it's dried and you're ready to cook it for the first time. Um, so if there's air bubbles inside that expand 
uh, at a rate greater than the way that the ceramic is or the, or the clay is expanding, then it will explode. And is that something that a more experienced potter can feel in, when they're when they're creating something that they can they can see that there there would be air bubbles? Yeah, there's reasons when when an air bubble is inside, it's it's usually because someone has been uh, has like when we wedge the clay, the point of wedging the clay is pressing uh, it into a pattern where all of the particles align and it's easier to throw or or work with, but also to push out any air bubbles. And so if you don't wedge correctly or you like accidentally, you know, squish in and add bubbles, that that's usually where that occurs yeah and so it's not i wouldn't say it's very common um Mm -hmm. once people have a sense for for the clay and when you're throwing you can feel an air bubble and then you just pop it with a with a Uh, yeah with a pin tool so i know that you have many artistic pursuits so where does ceramics fit in and tell us about some of the other things that you love to do yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, that is true. I, for me, ceramics is kind of like a, a home uh, where I might have a connection to a studio, and then I might need, I might move or start a new job, and I don't have as much time to make anymore, and I might not throw on the wheel for like three years. I think that was like the longest I went without throwing on the wheel, but then. There's, I always come back to it. I always find people who have a studio or or um, people who throw on the wheel and I can like nerd out with them and feel <laughs> connected and also and get access to the studios. And so it's kind of like a home that I come back to. And the other, I've just always made art throughout my life. Um, my grandfather was an artist and he taught me how to draw at a young age. And I've just, it's always been like my favorite subject. And uh, so, yeah, I draw and paint and uh, I write and I am always making things. So I think in the array of, of my creative practices, it's like clay is how I kind of center myself and, and come home to myself. And it's not as much how I like craft art and show it to the world. Like I don't do that as much actually with clay, which is why sometimes I can feel like awkward talking about it. Cause it feels like, um, it feels like this just sort of like friend that I hang out with throughout my life. Um, but I don't, I don't put them on display that often. <laughs> huh. Interesting. That's really interesting. Okay. So what do you put on display? Uh, probably writing and audio. Audio is, yeah, producing the show and publishing essays and, and bits of writing and being a copywriter is more like my outward facing, like, I have opinions, I have thoughts, I will, you know, I have this funny story and I will tell everyone. It's very like, I have a persona and it's not like that in the Clay Studio. In the Clay Studio, I'm like, like definitely in my own little world. Well, tell us t- then. Tell us more about Material Feels. Tell us oh, and and other audio projects that you have. Sure, Material Feels is like the main the main audio project for me right now. Uh, I started producing it uh, two and a half over two years ago now, and it kind of was like my love letter to the material world. And I also I was an art teacher for a long time, and I saw how people people of all ages would just be say things like, I'm not good at art. I'm not creative. And I, I was just, I was just like, that is, that's ridiculous. Like we're born creative. We are all, we all make marks or, or in some way, shape or form. And we all have creative impulses. And so the show was kind of born out of wanting to showcase that and talk about how all different kinds of people have, have, explored so many different kinds of materials for thousands of years and that's like a part of human culture that is really important yeah and what's upcoming what is where are you in your season and where is material feels going 
Uh, so I'm in a sort of hiatus period. So I still post episodes every month, but they're shorter and it's mostly me talking. I don't have guests right now. I'm, I'm building out season three and season three is, is going to be focused a lot on materials that are very close to the land, materials that are very embedded in environmentalism and, and sort of almost like stewarding the land, Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, uh, and how humans and the land and materials from the land are like, can can be in a symbiotic relationship and that can look like a creative practice. And I am looking for a home for the show. And I'm also thinking of applying for grants. Like I just, season three kind of is, is I'm producing it right now and and I'm going to push it out into the world when I feel like I can, um, I can have some support around it. So, so the dates are to be determined. Yeah, I would say sometime in 2022, and I'll just keep on posting um, the my hiatus episodes. You know, 15, 25 minutes a month of some kind of exploration of the material, but not my traditional 60 minute documentary. And and what's next for you outside of that? <laughs> I am looking to continue to create an audio. I think art and audio is a really beautiful overlap and art education. Uh, and so I'm just going to keep pursuing projects related to that where I can either speak about it, write about it, or help other people uh, create content that is aligned. And where can people find out more about you, about material feels, about how to support future projects of yours? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. <laughs> so Material Feels has a website. It's just materialfeelspodcast.com. You can also find it. Uh, we have a Patreon. So it'd be patreon.com slash material feels. Uh, and we have Instagram. We have social media. And you can find me, uh, I have a website, it's called cxmproductions.com. So uh, I call myself CXM, uh, those three letters, and then productions.com. And I will put all of those links into the show notes. Uh, Do you have courses of your own uh, online uh, available or, or not? I do lead workshops. I've led a handful of workshops and I'm, um, I have curriculum that where I talk about the creative process of building an, a, an audio piece uh, using like art techniques. And so it's blending art and audio. And I, that's the kind of thing that I set up case by case. So I don't have, kind. you can't like sign up online, but you can email me. And if you wanted to do something with your organization or with your class, um, I can, I, I create a class that is tailored to the group. All right. That sounds good. I will make that information available too. So Thanks. what, if anything, would you like to say in conclusion? I think that, well, if someone's starting, if someone's looking to start out and work with clay, I think the most important thing is to just show up, just go and, and get your hands in the material. And think if you, if you struggle with feeling confident in creative endeavors, or if you're really hard on yourself, I would encourage you to like, go with a friend, have really low expectations, like just be like, I, I want to do the thing and I don't need it to look a certain way. Just create, like, set yourself up for success in the sense that you will feel safe. Because if you're feeling like you have to perform, if you're feeling like you have to do a good job, that is not, I don't think that that's the best way to approach it. Because the the clay will respond to you. And if you're, like, just exploring and centered, you're going to have a nice experience with the clay. But if you're pushing the clay to do something that you're not ready to do and the clay is not ready to do, um, you're going to be frustrated and feel like I'm bad at this. That is really beautiful. And and in, I don't do tactile kinds of art. I do um, yeah. more ethereal, auditory kinds of things. But you're making clay sound really attractive. So that, that I, I might put my hands in some. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. I really, I love the way you, you speak about it. Oh, thank you.
I feel very privileged and grateful that I have had so much quality time with, with a handful of different materials. It really is a gift. And I think that when people are holding themselves back from exploring a material, it's like a disservice to themselves. Like if you have any, any inkling that you might want to try it, like, I think you should go for it. That's my philosophy. I completely agree. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I know. I've been reading about you on your, on your website and listening to some of your episodes. And I think I just love what you do. I think it's so important. Thank you. My thanks to Catherine Monahan. You can find out more about Catherine, Material Feels, and CXM Productions in the show notes. I invite everyone to write and tell me what you've always wanted to try. I'm Liz Sumner, reminding you to be bold, and thanks for listening. La, la, la.